I know you're going to dig this. I'm Skip the Funktologist, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Zooming all the way in from Memphis, Tennessee, from the funk band, the prolific, the bar case, it's the bass man himself, James Alexander. James, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. And how are you this good day? Hey, man, I'm I'm doing great. I'm just trying to stay out of the way, you know, with all of these pandemic times. Uh, I'm flying. Uh, I'm somewhere between the sky and the earth. I'm not touching ground nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all should follow that example. <laughs> yeah. well, all right, James. Like, hey, let's get into the history of the bar case. I know we will have to go a long ways back. But uh, let's start at the beginning. How did the bar case, the original first unit, come together? Well, the bar case started in junior high school. Uh, you know, we were guys that in junior high school, and we just, you know, we just started, hey, man, we were in, we were in the marching band, and so we just started playing together, man. And, uh, you know, we all were kind of like evenly yoked. I mean, we all had a passion for music. You know, but being, you know, teenagers and younger, we didn't know what we were doing, but mm -hmm. we know we wanted to do something different. And uh, that's how the bar case actually came together. Okay. So as you guys started progressing, uh, did you become, you know, some studio musicians that led you to your affiliation with Stax Record? How did that come about? Well, let, let me just bring you up to date before we even got to the studio part of it. Um, we were all uh, musicians in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, we went to various high schools in Memphis. So first of all, we all changed to one high school. Well, I mean, we went three, four different high schools in Memphis. So we all changed to one high school, which was the high school that I was at, Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, we had one white guy in the group. He, you know, back in those times, you know, you know, everything was segregated. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine he changed from a predominantly white high school to a predominantly black high school and his parents mm -hmm. just went ballistic. They just, mm -hmm. I mean, this is in the sixties now. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So they, they, they couldn't, they didn't understand, uh, you know, white guy changing to a black school, but that's what he wanted to do because he wanted to be with the Barquets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then leading up from that point forward, how did this Stacks affiliation come about? Long story. We were playing at a nightclub in Memphis, Tennessee called the Hippodrome. And we had heard about Stacks Records and we had started auditioning for Stacks Records. Actually, the first time, you know, we went to audition, we auditioned with uh steve cropper you know who was with booker tnmg's mm -hmm. and you know we thought we were pretty hot you know but he didn't think so he just thought we were just okay so he just said hey i like you guys but you know i don't think you know y'all are ready for the you know the big league yet mm -hmm. so he said okay we didn't get discouraged too much you know mm -hmm. because we were we were playing at this nightclub called the hippodrome illegally because man you we were minors still Right. So we weren't supposed to be playing in the nightclub because you have to be at least 21. And so we auditioned the first time. He didn't accept us. So we auditioned again. And um, he turned us down again. Mm. So when we were leaving the second time, the owner of the label, the owner of Stacks Records, Mr. Jim Stewart, saw us, 
And he said, who are y'all? We said, we're the Barcades. He said, I've been watching what's going on. Uh, you guys have auditioned. Why don't y'all come back one more time and audition for me? So the following Sunday, we went back again, you know, after playing this nightclub on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. This particular Saturday night, we were playing a little riff behind one of the soul children. Have you heard of the soul children before? No. no. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, there was a song called But It's All Right by J.J. Jackson. Oh, yeah, I recognize that. Yeah. You know, you, know uh, you can hurt me, but it's all right. But anyway, we played a little groove on this song. So when we went to the studio, we started playing this little groove. Mm -hmm. And the owner of the studio said, what is that? We said, it's just a little groove we play it. So we were already in the studio. So he ran up in the control room. He said, play it from the beginning. We said, okay. And then Ben Cauley, our trumpet player, puts this little nursery rhyme horn lick on there. And Soul Finger was born. And that's how our career started off. Uh, that was our first record. And uh, still, 50 some odd years later, that's still our biggest record. Right. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? That is something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so James, something that, right. Something that I've always wondered, how did you guys come up with the name, the Barcades? Coming up with the name of the Barcades, it had to do with our desire to own a ranch. And it, it, it's kind of like a double thing. You know, we, we wanted to own a ranch. And also, uh, it was about us it was about uh, really Bacardi rum, you know, Bacardi mm -hmm. bar. Yeah. And then if we had a ranch, it was going to be called the bar K ranch. Oh, so okay. between those two things, the bar K's were born. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. okay. Moving up now, you guys became the, the rhythm section for Otis Ready. How did that now come about? Well, Let's go back to the same club that we play at all the time. Mm -hmm. Otis Redding was in town doing a show, you know, at the at the Mid South Coliseum. You know, back in those days, they did what you call packet shows. You know, it'd be seven or eight artists on the mm -hmm. show. You know, because the artists didn't go and do like forty five minutes or an hour set. You know, the artists basically did their hit songs. You know, right. they had one hit song mm -hmm. or two hit songs, and they were gone. Right. So. Otis was in town doing a concert at the Mid-South Coliseum. So, you know, entertainers, when they get through doing the, their concert, they always like to go to whatever the, the hot club in town. Mm -hmm. So Otis came down to this club and he heard the band playing and he asked the club on, he said, you know, do they know, you think they might know some of my songs? And he said, why don't you ask them? <laughs> so he came up and asked us, do we know some of his songs? Mm -hmm. And we started playing behind him and he, he sit in with us and played a couple of songs with us. Mm -hmm. and then they sing. The next thing you know, he wants us to be his band. Mm -hmm. So he went to our parents. You know, our parents what didn't want us to go out of town. So he went to our parents. He said he was going to get tutors for us and everything. But our parents said, no, they cannot do anything until they graduate from high school. So mm -hmm. the day we graduated from high school, we left and we went on the road with Otis Red. Mm. Okay. All right. And of course, you know, so James, this is the unfortunate part. You know, we know about the, the plane accident in 1967 that killed Otis and other members of the Bar case. So after that whole situation happened, what was your motivation? You know, because you and Ben were the left remaining members. What was your motivation just to continue the Bar case? What was your motivation? My motivation was this, you know, Little did we know that growing up, you know, and, and I don't say this, um, I don't say this, uh, you know, like trying to stick my chest out or anything like that, but we had wisdom beyond our years. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we, we, we would often sit around and talk about and say stuff like, you know, if something happens to one of us, whoever is left, please carry on. Mm -hmm. uh, little did I know that I would be the person left to carry on because, mm -hmm. man, you, 
I was the last person to come into the group. Mm. I was the last person to join the bar case. Mm -hmm. And I actually joined the bar case because the bass player that they had before me, he did not, he was the bass player, but he didn't own a bass. Mm. I, owned, I owned a bass guitar, but I didn't know how to play it. <laughs> so I used to take my bass guitar to the rehearsals every Saturday and let mm -hmm. him use my bass. Mm. So this one particular so this one particular Saturday, uh, I went to rehearsal with my bass, and the bass player didn't show up. Mm. And they said, man, we're ready to start our rehearsal. Who's going to play bass? And they said, you are. I said, but there's one small problem. And they said, what is that? I can't play. <laughs> <laughs> so the guitar player said, okay, I'll teach you, I'll I teach you enough to get through this. Mm -hmm. I, said, I mean, I said, man, I'm horrible. I don't know how to play anything. I don't even know how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's notice Fleets as White as Snow. I don't know how to play any of that stuff. <laughs> so so the next Saturday, their bass player showed back up in rehearsal. And so just like I do every Saturday, I drove, you know, I rode my bicycle to the rehearsal with my bass mm -hmm. and let him use and, and, you know, set my bass up for him and gave him the bass and they said oh no it's in the bass player was saying what do you mean oh no you're not our bass player anymore he is meaning mm -hmm. he meaning me mm -hmm. james alexander mm -hmm. james alexander is the new bass player mm -hmm. in the bar case mm -hmm. yeah so how did that how did that go over with him <laughs> not too good <laughs> not too good to say the least i mean but uh um, mm -hmm. that's how that's how i got into the bar case and like right. i said i had no earthly idea that i would be the one to carry the group on forward mm -hmm. okay so let's move forward now how did larry okay. Dotson come into the picture because i'm a big fan of larry i mean i just love his singing his wow. style. how did he come into the picture well, you know, Larry had his own group. Larry had a group called the Tim Prees. Mm -hmm. Which I know of them. Yeah, I've heard yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was this group. He put it together. So, you know, up to that point, we would, you know, up to 1969, 1970, you know, we were just 100% our instrumental band. And we said, you know, it's time for us to venture out a little bit and not just be an instrumental band. Mm -hmm. you know, start doing some live stuff. So uh, I heard about this guy. We heard, you know, we heard about various, you know, lead singers and various vocalists, but we heard about um, Larry Dotson. So I went to this club to, you know, check him out one night. You know, I just casually checking him out. Mm -hmm. So when they took a break on their intermission, I told him that I wanted to talk to him. And uh, he said, well, you can talk to me now. I said, well, not, no, y'all doing y'all show. You know, I can wait. He said, no, you can talk to me now. And, it, and he said, well, what is it about? Well, we were thinking about, you know, adding a lead vocalist to our group. He said, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> so I, I often tell him, I often, you know, we have this joke going most of the time. I often tell him, I said, you know, you answered too quick because <laughs> it, it must not have been nothing too much going on with your group. Cause you joined our group too quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you you were willing to join our group uh, too quick. Mm -hmm. But the strange thing happened when he went back and told the guys uh, in the Tim Freeze that he was leaving to join the Barcades. They beat his ass. Really? They wow. beat him up. They wow. jumped on him. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> they jumped. They surely did. They jumped on him. Wow! So that that was more incentive for him to leave, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I think I think after all of that, it was time for him to go. Yeah, yeah. So then, when Larry George, uh, you know, joins the band, it appears that you guys must have sat down and kind of mapped out a direction because after he joined that bar case sound, it changed, and now you vocals were were up front now you know, as opposed to being an instrumental band. So was that a concept you guys sat down and figured it out or did it just evolve on its own? You know, 
we were already, you know, we was always in an experimental type thing. We, you know, we were just trying to reach. We were just reaching. We was reaching for different stuff. We didn't know exactly what we was reaching for. Mm -hmm. uh, but when Larry came on board, you know, we, we was trying our hand at black rock. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. you know, we, we, you know, we. If you look at some of the costumes and stuff that we wore, we, you know, we, we dressed kind of weird, mm -hmm. but uh, people loved it. So we just kept on going, and we just kind of like kept evolving. And and you know, mm -hmm. we just, you know, with with Larry. Uh, we really e evolved into, you know, to something really major. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, James, one of the things, of course, I'm from that era, you know, of, of music. And I've always appreciated that, you know, the bands back in the day, everybody had their distinct sound and their distinct look. You know, when you heard a Bar K song, you knew it was the Bar K's. And, you know, if it was Earth, Wind and & Fire, if it was Cool and the Gang, it was the Commodores, James Brown, whatever. You know, the music today, man, there's too much, there's too much similarity in the artists. And it's sometimes a little hard to differentiate between who it is unless you specifically know that artist. So with, with that having been said, it leads me to my next question. In the time that you've been in the music industry, 50 plus years, you've seen it go from here to here. So what do you like about the music industry today? And what don't you like about it? Well, I, I don't like, you know, everything, everybody's trying to sound like each other. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, there's not a much, there's not as much originality right. in the music. Right. Right. Uh, if you remember right. back in the day, uh, when Confunction came on, you knew it was Confunction. Mm -hmm. When the Barcades mm -hmm. came on, you knew it was the Barcades. When the right. Ohio Players right. came on, you knew it was the you know it was the Ohio Players. Right. You knew it was Boosie. You knew it was Roger. You knew right. it was George Clinton and the Parliament Funkadelic. Right. You knew it was Larry Graham. Right. You knew it was Slime and Family Stone. Right. You knew it was Shaka Khan. You just knew. Right. Now, you can listen to the radio and you hear three, four, five different records, and all of them might sound almost the same. Exactly, exactly. So I like I like the originality in the artists before. Today, everything is, you know, everything is so, uh, you know. Yeah, it's, it's cookie cutter. <laughs> yeah, it's cookie cutter. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we always say is that one size does not fit all. Right. <laughs> And that's you know, the truth. Just, just think about it. Just think about it. If if we were all alike, this would be a very boring world. You believe, you said it. You sure enough said it. I I like the difference. I like you know people have you know being different. All right, James. So of course you know this broadcast is sponsored by the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center. Uh, do you agree and support the fact that we need a Funk Music Hall of Fame? Without question, mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of these artists that are out there now stand on the shoulders of funk. Mm -hmm. They stand on the shoulders of uh, George Clinton, the Ohio Players, the Bar Case, Sly and the Family Stone, mm -hmm. and all of the groups from Ohio, Slave, mm -hmm. uh, the Ohio Players, mm -hmm. Zap, right. and Roger, Boosie. Okay. Mm -hmm. Babyface, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Right, right. No question about it. No question about it. Well, we certainly appreciate it, you know, as you move about and do what you do to, to keep the Funk Music Hall of Fame Center in mind and, and you share with people that the organization exists. Go to the website and uh, support it. And just we want to keep funk alive. That's the whole purpose of this center is to keep funk alive because, you know, uh, James, as a radio host, I've got a program that's heard internationally. I can tell you, and I always say this, that funk music as an American art form has spread out all over the world. I get all kinds of artists from different countries sending me their version of what they call funk. So it's an art form that has definitely spread out all over the world, and it definitely deserves its place in the whole musical history of what it has accomplished. Well, this, let me ask you this. Did Mr. Webb play you the, uh, you know, I sent Mr. Webb the new single by the Barcades. How did, how did you like it? Uh, I haven't received it yet, but I will get it from him though. 
Right. But I haven't received okay. it yet. Mm -hmm. But we get ready to come out with a new record. We're finna come out smoking again. <laughs> so that's good to hear. So basically what you're saying, the bar caves are continuing on because I know that Larry retired here a little while ago, but the band as a whole is still going to continue on. That's right. Oh, no question. I mean, we have a new sing We have a new lead singer who is dynamic. He's younger. In fact, my wife was listening to some of the new music that we have, and she said, oh, you guys sound young. <laughs> well, we know that we some old guys, but, you know, hey, mm -hmm. hey, I mean, actually, somebody still, you know, we, we still got some fans out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No question about it. Okay. Right. All right. Well, James, man, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and give us some history of the bar case. It's good to hear that the band is continuing on. Looking forward to the new music that's out. And uh, listen, we wish you nothing but the best and continued success. Well, look, just anytime you want to talk to me, man, hey, just feel free. Okay. I mean, I'm always available. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to work with me because, you know, I have, you know, I'd be wearing a whole lot of different hats. Yeah, I, I understand. And, uh, with this, you know, with this pandemic, you know, things move a little different now. Right. But we right. still move and we're still keeping it going. Okay, and here's another thing I'll throw in before we let you go. If you have some funk paraphernalia that you can donate to the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center, uh, let Mr. Webb know. He would love to have that along with all the other items that are presented at the center. Okay, I'll do that. I mean, okay. I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, thank you. All right, James, well, you had a, have a good rest of the day, and we will speak with you soon. Okay, I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, same life, likewise. All right, bye. Thank so everybody, you. this has been the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's TV show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live from DATV Studios in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, the land of funk. And until next time, keep it funky. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,